Good morning from New York City. Uh, good afternoon and good evening from uh, Europe uh, and uh, Asia. Uh, my name is Robert Lookstein, and it's my uh, honor to uh, welcome all of you to uh, Treat Live. Uh, for those of you that have been our partners uh, over the last several years, Treat Live is the culmination of a vision of uh, our division here in New York City, uh, specifically the Vascular and Interventional Radiology Division in uh, New York City, uh, to uh, conduct and to facilitate live educational content around the field of interventional radiology and endovascular therapy. Uh, our concept for this uh, content has evolved uh, over the last several years. Um, we have uh, held uh, multiple face-to-face uh, uh, live case courses here at our uh, wonderful campus at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, right before the pandemic, we evolved into a, a virtual course before virtual was a, uh, a popular uh, format uh, to conduct uh, CME content. Uh, and now we're back uh, with a monthly live uh, case-based streaming uh, format uh, regarding, again, interventional radiology and endovascular therapy. Uh, this uh, course uh, will be conducted uh, by the Division of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the faculty in the Division of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at uh, Mount Sinai. I want to thank the uh, staff in the uh, labs, uh, specifically all of our techs and nurses that uh, allow us to take care of our patients uh, every single day. Our wonderful house staff uh, who have tirelessly prepared uh, this uh, live case that we're about to uh, share with you and will be obviously uh, participating in all of our ongoing efforts uh, moving forward. Uh, we have uh, countless corporate supporters uh, that I just wanted to take a moment to uh, thank without their uh, ongoing partnership. Uh, this concept would not become a, a reality. I want to thank all of you, our registrants. And uh, as of uh, this morning, we have 150 people registered on this webcast from multiple countries around the world. So this is truly a global educational effort, which is always uh, very humbling. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, broadcast uh, BroadMed AV. Uh, which, in uh, my opinion, is the absolute uh, best partner, best in class partner to allow this uh, live CME content uh, to be presented to you. Uh, and uh, they've just been phenomenal partners getting this set up. Um, to forecast how the rest of the year is going to work, we have a phenomenal case that uh, the group has prepared to share with you this morning. Uh, we're planning on uh, showing uh, live cases every month, the uh, second Friday of every month uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, and these will be cases, again, focused on interventional radiology and all aspects of uh, endovascular therapy. Uh, and for those of you that have partnered with us over the years, uh, we have a very, very broad multidisciplinary group with multiple colleagues and partners, not just in interventional radiology around the world, but also endovascular neurosurgery and vascular and endovascular surgery. And so we're going to be uh, curating content that represents all disciplines and all facets of endovascular therapy uh, moving forward. So it's going to be a very, very uh, exciting year. Um, and we're obviously looking uh, for uh, feedback from all of our partners, not only our audience and our registrants, but our, again, our corporate partners as well on how we can iterate this product uh, and make it most impactful uh, for our partners uh, around the world. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, thank Backtable, uh, which has been uh, an incredible partner about uh, really developing the concept of this educational content and has you know, certainly helped us uh, share the vision for this, not only across the United States, uh, but around the world as well. So without any further uh, delay, I'm going to uh, uh, share the screen or uh, hand it off to my uh, a partner, colleague, and friend, uh, Aaron Fishman, who's uh, in the lab right now. He's in room one. All right. Well, welcome to Mount Sinai. Welcome to room one. Uh, it's really a, an incredible honor and, and, and privilege to be able to pre present this case for you guys today. Uh, I know Rob spent a few minutes introducing this. this
Uh, we're, we're very excited to, to present this case to you guys today. We also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Broadmed AV, which is really one of the best in the industry. Um, and this is obviously our brand new Philips room. This is the new Philips Azurian room, so I want to thank Philips as well, as well as Backtable, who's going to partner with us in the future and help us create CME content. So to my left here is Dr. Uh, Dan Chilo, and to my right is Dr. Puneet Rana, one of our esteemed interventional residents. Um, I'm also joined in the room by uh, one of our great nurses, Andrea, and our techs, Debbie, and our CRNA, Heather. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Puneet, and he's going to show you guys uh, what we're doing here today, and then we'll go over what we've done so far. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, today, we're going to present a case of transradial prostate artery embolization using glue and VCA. Uh, so we have a 72-year-old male with symptomatic BPH. His LUTs include frequency, intermittent nocturia, one to two times every other night, incomplete emptying, urgency, intermittency, and also he has weak stream. In addition, patient reports he has erectile dysfunction. <coughs> He's failed medical management in the past. Most recently, he's been on oxybutynin for overactive bladder, but has had no improvement, so discontinued. Um, he's seeking minimally invasive, non-surgical treatment for his urinary symptoms as it's affecting his daily life and his ability to enjoy traveling. All right, his IPSS score is 18. That puts him in the moderate range. His QOL score is five, making him unhappy. Uh, SHIM score of two, severe ED. Uh, PSA last year was 3.1. Uh, in, in office Euro flow, Qmax uh, was 10 mils per second, and his post void was about 30 cc's. Past medical history includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, GERD, BPH, surgical history of VP shunt, uh, hernia repair, sigmoid resection. These are his medications. He has an allergy to Amproxen. Uh, we got a CTA of the pelvis as our non-invasive imaging, and that demonstrates a prostate volume of approximately 105 cc's. Uh, his intravesical prostatic protrusion measures about 10 millimeters, which, is, which puts him up to grade 3 severe. Um, we also uh, noticed on the non-invasive imaging that he has variant anatomy. He has a left-sided corona mortis that's arising from the deep inferior epigastric artery. It's noted there by the arrow. Um, the MIPS, the coronal MIPS demonstrate minimal tortuosity of the iliac arteries, which makes them a pretty good candidate for radial access. Um, we also did a couple MIP re reconstructions in like 30 degree LAO, RAO. Um, to see, you know, the, the branching pattern of the internal iliacs. Um, it's it's kind of tough to say for him exactly where the origin of prostate comes off of, but we think maybe on one side it might be a, a type 4. We'll, we'll see, introp. Um, so assessment and plan. This is a 72-year-old male with symptomatic BPH. Uh, treatment options for him are going to be medical management, uh, prostate, or I guess medical management, which he's already failed, um, prostate artery embolization, a uh, TERP, aqua ablation, Eurolift, resume, whole lip, and prostatectomy. Uh, his gland size is, you know, about 105 cc's, which is above the standard for Eurolift and resume. Um, and the patient prefers minimally invasive non-surgical treatment. So uh, we're here today doing a transradial prostate artery embolization. Um, in regards to the equipment details, uh, we're doing radial access. So we're going to use a radial cocktail, including of heparin, verapamil, and nitroglycerin. Um, we're using a slender five French uh, glide sheath in the wrist, left radial artery. Um, and our base catheter is a five French by 130 centimeter neuron select Bernstein catheter. And through that, we have a, a Benson wire. Um, in regards to the microcatheters, there's several options out there. Um, we typically use the 2.2 French sniper balloon occlusion microcath, um, but we've used um, Prograte Lambda or the 2 French True Select. Um, and then in regards to microwires, typically we, we start off with the 016 Fathom wire. Um, if we do encounter some complex anatomy, then we'll bring out the 016 Asai Meister wire. 
Um, and our embolic of choice is going to be 1 to 10 NVCA to lapidal mixture. And in regards to uh, discussion, um, the IPP, uh, we, we, present, or we published a case, I guess, uh, a report, sorry, um, in 2020 um, that discussed outcomes of prostate artery embolization between patients who've had severe, which is greater than 10 millimeters of IPP, and non-severe, which is less than 10 millimeters of IPP. Um, and we found that there was no significant differences in early outcomes of patients who underwent PAE with severe versus non-severe intra, uh, intravesical prosthetic protrusion. And then there's a lot of studies out there that kind of discuss the use of NVCA in prostate artery embolization. Um, majority of them show that you know it, it's a safe and effective alternative. Um, there are some studies that also demonstrate that uh, there's lower fluoro use uh, and also shorter procedure times. Um, but yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Puneet. Um, I'm going to go to the fluoro if you guys want to switch over to that. I want to show you what we've done so far. The other thing I'll, I'll ask is if we could zoom in on the wrist a little bit, uh, if that's possible, using the other camera. Just want to show you where we are right now. Okay. Can you guys zoom in on the wrist a little bit? Can you see that? Let's, we can move that. Yeah, right there. A little bit. That'd be great. Okay, so we have the arm tucked very close to the side. Uh, this is our standard approach for radial access, as you guys can see here. This is a five French slender, as Puneet mentioned. We usually access a little bit higher on the wrist, approximately about that much higher than the styloid process, which gives us ample space to be able to get our diagnostic catheter pretty close to the prostate artery, which as you'll see in a few minutes, that's one of the key things, in my view, to getting very close and getting a, a quick cannulation of the prostate artery. This diagnostic catheter that we have in here is a 130 centimeter penumbra burn tip. Uh, and this is a nice catheter, 040 lumen. But what I like about this for radial axis is it's 130 centimeters. So this gives us a, a few extra centimeters to get to the target vessel. We're actually hooked up to the power injector right now, but we haven't done the angio yet. But I'm gonna go back to the fluoro and show you what we did so far. Let's see. Can you play that first run, Debbie? We came down uh, the arm, we used a Benson wire and we didn't get the wire to go immediately into the into the, the arch. So we did an angiogram and he does have some vascular disease. So we switched to a glide wire here and we were able to cannulate the ascending aorta pretty easily. You can see the calcification on the aorta here. And so when we see that, uh, we often will switch very quickly to a Simmons catheter. We usually use a Simmons one. Uh, so in, in that scenario, we put down an exchange wire. In this case, we used a Benson wire. And we form our Simmons in the, in the heart, as you can see here. Once it forms, then we basically just pull it back and we cannulate the descending aorta, advance our, our long wire, usually a Benson, and then we switch out for our, our diagnostic catheter, which in this case is the, the 130 Berenstein. So we came down very easily. Uh, we did a quick angio here showing the bifurcation. And the way we visualize the bifurcation is typically contralateral from the side that we're on. So we're currently on the left side of the patient. This is the left common and internal external iliac arteries here. When we set up the angio, we typically use the contralateral to open up that, that origin. And, and that's where we are right now. So uh, we cannulated the internal iliac. We're going to set up an angio here. Uh, we're all set up to do that. We're going to go 4 for 20 typically in the internal iliac, and we're going to see what type of origin we have in the prostate. So we're going to step out for one sec. And then if you guys have any questions, we're gonna step out. this would be a good time to start asking. Vivian and Jay, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, How are you? Awesome. Good, good. Um, so, I, you know, I want to ask just quickly because, you know, it looked like a little bit of work to it's get down. Um, what kind of floor time are you looking at right now? And, you know, I think probably people wonder 
why are you even going radial? If you want to touch on that really quickly. We go a, a little uh, reflux there. Um, we at, we're at four minutes of floro time. That's good. So I'm going to walk back into the room and we're going to just put up the images while we talk. Um, four minutes of floro time. And really it was just that, that, that getting down the arch with the Simmons that took a few extra, uh, extra minutes of floro time. But other than that, um, I think radial axis is a lot easier to cannulate some of these difficult origins. And this is exactly what we saw on the, uh, on the CT, by the way. Um, That's what it looks like. But I think, I think radial access gives us the best chance in most cases, not every case, to get very close to the prostate origin. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do that with a femoral approach. And so it's sort of a, an interesting concept because a lot of people, when they do these, these cases, they'll leave their base catheter almost too high in my, in my view. And I'd rather uh, be able to torque the catheter almost as, almost as close to the prostate origin as possible. I'll tell you in a second. Um, so this is interesting. What do you guys think of this angiogram? I'm gonna go back to this image here. The first thing that we notice, and we knew this from the CTA, which is another reason why the CTA is so valuable, um, is that we have no obturator artery here. So uh, given, given that that's the case, it makes it a lot easier to visualize the anatomy. And so Puneet was showing me before how to do this. I'm going to go pull up processing and I'm going to zoom in here. So tell me if you guys can see this on the screen. I'm going to start drawing on the screen. You press that one? Yeah. This is our new Phillips room, so you can do all this fancy stuff here. I'm going to draw. Let me do that. Oops. That's two fingers, I think. All right, here we go. Two fingers. Two fingers. This is the SVA right here, as we all can see, right? How do I zoom out? There we go. And we don't see the obturator. As we come down, we see the inferior glute here, and we see the pudendal. And if you look closely, it looks like the prostate artery, which is this vessel here, we're going to trace it all the way back, originates off the side of the pudendal, which is right here. At least that's what I think based on this image. Do we all agree? Definitely. So this is a classic yeah. type four origin, although it's a little angulated. So, you know, before we cannulate these, what I like to think about is which microcatheter would give us the best chance of cannulating this, which wire. And then obviously we want to, tr if we're using NBCA, we want to try to use, I like to try to use balloon occlusion whenever possible. It gives us a much deeper penetration, which we can talk about in a few minutes. Um, the other thing that we're going to try to do, which we can do right now, is push the base catheter a little closer to the pudendal. We could probably almost even cannulate the pudendal with the, with the base catheter. I don't really have an issue cannulating these, these vessels, particularly the pudendal and the obturator with a base catheter. We could probably remove those, those marks, my, my John Madden marks there. There we go. So one of the things that I, that I, that I like to do is use this base, ca base catheter without a wire sometimes. And I'm just going to push it a little bit closer. So Puni had now a that we, slide. Um, Sorry, Aaron. Yeah. I was going to say, put no, in a great slide showing the escalation um, approach. So you're looking at this um, angio, and um, are you thinking that balloon occlusion is, are you still thinking that that's the way to I, go? Or are you yeah. concerned that you may not be able to track it into that very tortuous uh, prostatic origin? You turn coupling off, Debbie. I think we can get it in, no problem. Uh, so we're going to use the sniper, I think, to start on this side. And what's interesting about that CTA is it, you know, it didn't show in detail, but it did, it did show this origin if you look, go back and look at it. So I'm not surprised that we have a type four here. Aaron, do you insist? Do you on see the, the origin CTA? there? I mean, it looks like it might be in a different spot. I obliqued it a little bit more. Yeah, it might be coming off the uh, inferior glute. Yeah. Inferior glute. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's not. I was a little little surprised that it was coming off that portion of the pudendal, which is not typically what we see. So you're right. I think it is coming off the glute. So that would make this a type five origin, not a type yeah. four, if that's the case. So did we you, prepped did the you the, your the sniper for these views. I, I don't know. Yeah. If, so uh, so Puneet mentioned audience. this earlier. He said 30 degrees as a, as a place to start. Um, this is a 45. Actually, no. This is a 40. 49. 49. So we obliqued it more. And, and, and so I'll usually start with cranial. 30. 10 cranial. Yeah. yeah, I think the majority of us are doing some 35 to 45 ipsy oblique on the side that we end up in and with a 10 cranial, like you said. 
Let's there put that up as a smart mask. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Keep talking. Oh, we can talk while insist, we work. Do you insist on a CTA for every patient that you see in the office? It's not a requirement, Jay, but I, I think it's really helpful, uh, you know, for lots of reasons. We can keep going. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of patient selection, do you have a size and cut up minimum for uh, volume wise for the prostate that you treat? Well, that's a that's an interesting question. That's a completely separate question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, you know, look, at smaller smaller <laughs> prostates are much harder to embolize, as we all know. Plus, they're not going to get the same volume reduction and potentially the same response. And so, you know, the smaller the prostate, the harder it is, and I think the less likely you're going to get a, a dramatic improvement. It doesn't mean that you can't get it. It just makes it a lot more challenging. So there is no real cutoff, Jay. But I think, you know, once you get below forty, it becomes really really hard. Yeah, I mean, I think that just to, to unpack it one step at a time, the CTA is definitely going to show you lots of good information. It's going to show you that process if you don't have an ultrasound or anything like that. It's going to show you bifurcation. Ooh, it's going to show you uh, coronal mortis. Or can you like this? Um, it's going to give you a lot of information. And if you, you know, it gives you more things about. like other pathology, bladder pathology. You know, it's going to give you a lot of information. So I don't think oh, it's a requirement, but I think it's incredibly bad. helpful yeah. um, in kind of working up the patient in the office. So I'm noticing you're not using a uh, a TUI. You want to comment on that? No, I don't like the TUIs anymore for prostates because I like to be able to move the microcatheter and remove it quickly, as you see when we do glue. So I stopped using them for the for these cases. So the the other thing that we're going to do, uh, I'm going to take Puneet's going to put the wire all the way down the inferior glute. Oh, actually, sorry, he already got in, yeah. so <laughs> we're going to just go with it. <laughs> all right. So once we get a fair amount of wire, the other thing, well, we can do it now. I'm going to take the base catheter and bring it down a little bit without losing our access. Just to give it a little bit more stability. And so now that we have uh, a fair amount of wire into the prostate artery, I'm going to just sort of try to get this to go as smooth as possible. And it, it tracked pretty well. So now that we're in, in the prostate artery, or what we think is the prostate artery, we're going to go back to a little less oblique. And we're going to center a little bit lower. We're going to take this wire out, and we're going to do an angio and see where we're at. Yeah. Any other questions on, the, on your end, guys? There's probably a lot, I would imagine. I mean, in terms yeah, of talking um, about the radial axis that we were doing, um, you know, I think we ran into the situation where there was a little bit of tortuosity in the arch, and we quickly kind of troubleshooted with something that we're familiar with, and I think it just comes down to... You know, you're good at navigating things that you do a lot of. So if you're not familiar, you might, you know, poke around for a while. But because we have experience with it, you know, six minutes into this, we're in the prostate artery. And I think, you know, just like we have ways of, you know, troubleshooting a difficult arch, if we were femoral, you know, it's just one of those things that as you get facile with it, it just becomes kind of more second nature. So just to give you guys an update, so that we're going to pull back a little bit. I just gave a little puff there. Yeah, there we go. Um, we're at seven minutes of fluoro time. Yeah. So this is the first angio. So we have a couple things here that are interesting. I think that vessel that we were in a little bit too deep was probably a rectal branch, if I had to guess. And the other thing that we see here is a fair amount of spasm. Even though this is a small catheter, it's actually a very small vessel. So we're going to give some nitro. We are very liberal with our with our vasodilators when we do prostate embolization. We're going to give about 250 cc's of nitro right now, and then we're going to follow that with verapamil. One of the interesting things about using these medications, and I, I like to call this the poor man's cone beam CT, is the patient will tell you what vessel you're in when you deliver these. So typically, if you're in the prostate artery, they feel it in their penis. So that's number one. And if you're in the rectal branch, they'll feel it in their anus. Um, and then obviously, if you're in other branches, they'll tell you what, you know, what, what, what vascular territory it is. So it's a really good way to find out what vessel you're in if you don't have access to cone beam CT. So in this scenario, would you try to go distal to the rectal, um, rectal artery, or um, how would you manage that? So we're going we're gonna to give the vasodilators. We're going to repeat the angio. Before we go distal, I like to give the vasodilators. I think it's going to give us the best chance of success here. Um, so that was that was the verapamil we just gave. We're going to flush and we're going to contrast. repeat the NGO. This is contrast or flush? Oh. Yes, but I agree with you, Viv. We should go distal. You can see that prostate artery uh, pretty well here. And you can see the middle lobe pretty well, too. We'll get a better picture. But if you look closely at this angio, 
you'll see these little spidery branches that are going north. That's the that's the, uh, the the median lobe vascular supply, and so we really want to try to get embolic into that spot. But we'll see. Okay. I think you're seeing like nice periurethral supply too, and even cross some cross filling to the other side. Just on this view. Yeah. Maybe we can back so up a little bit view. and just talk about yeah. sort of uh, you know the in office discussion. You know, you mentioned a lot of alternative. Um, treatments that patients may be asking about. How do you counsel your patients in the office? We're going to go more distal. Let's grab that yeah. wire. Okay. Um, well, you want to be able to talk to them about all the different options. And so, you know, PA is a great option for this patient, but not for everybody, obviously. Um, we go over all the alternatives. You know, his prostate's a little bit big for TERP, but there are people that would TERP this. Um, resume and... Can we put that up as a roadmap? Uh, we did. Um, we gave. Resume and, and Eurolift are much more popular these two. days, as everybody knows. But but the you know the most of the studies that have been done on those those treatments are with prostates below below ninety grams, and so he's a little bit big for that. Um, Holep is obviously a, a good option for large prostates, but there's not a lot of operators around the country that do Holep. Um, Prostatectomy is not a common procedure done for, PA, for, for BPH these days, but obviously that's an option too. Um, and then aquablation is a new therapy that's not as size limited as, as Eurolift and Resume, uh, but some of the early studies that looked at aquablation had a fair amount of bleeding in large prostates. And so there are some people around the country that are using PAE prior to aquablation, sometimes prior to TERP, and even sometimes prior to HOLEP and people who are at high risk for bleeding. Um, it looks like... It looks like that's not the vessel we want to go right. into, right? So what we're going to do, is we're going to pull this back a little bit. There we go. Yep, there we go. Yeah, we're going to try to make that turn. Usually we try to make the turn with the wire. There we go. Before we actually bring down, because this catheter is a little bit stiff, and so you want to just make sure that you get it. That's a good spot right Lovely. there. I like that. So we're in a good spot, I think, to probably start embolization. And again, eight minutes and... What's what's a good spot for embolization? Well, we want to be we want to be as deep as we think we can get. I mean, we don't want to go too far. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to the old, uh, we're, we're going to do an, one more angio and then we'll fill it up. The old perfected technique that that Carnevale demonstrated, you do proximal first and then distal, but that really only applies to particles. It's not as relevant when you're using a balloon and or liquid embolic. And so this is another reason why we like this because it can actually get a proximal and a distal embolization. Uh, with one, with one injection. But you guys tell me if you like this spot. Would you guys go more distal? Maybe a little bit, actually. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, let's go a little bit more distal, just around that bend. Were you were you originally using cone beam CT in these scenarios, and you've you've come away from it, or can you talk about your decision tree not to to routinely use? It? Well, cone beam CT is really used, I think, for three. You can put that up, Debbie, as a, as a roadmap. Cone beam CT is probably uh, useful in three scenarios. Number one, looking, at, looking for the prostate artery using an embolization guidance or something along those lines. Um, so that's one. The second reason is potentially to look for, look for collaterals and other feeders. And so we often get distracted by the main prostate artery when we forget about collaterals. There's often multiple pedicles that feed the, the blood supply to the prostate, in particular the pudendal below and the superior vesicular above. So in those scenarios, the combing beam CT with embolization guidance can actually show you all the feeders at once. Uh, but there are angiographic signs that, that, that allow you to do that without potentially uh, needing to do that. And then the last reason we do comb beam CT is to look at the coverage of the gland after embolization which we may actually do today to show uh, what that looks like for everybody as a demonstration. How do you feel so about that? I think that, that looks good. That looks pretty think? good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to go too far in here, but we want to be able to get a, a good deep penetration without, right. uh, without worrying about too much non-target. We have a question. I mean, we always the have the option of giving a little bit more nitro, a little bit more verapamil, depending on yeah, what Yeah, let me give it more nitro. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, it ba it's kind of going back to, uh, you know, your approach from a radial access in terms of screening for disease in the arch. Um, how or do you do that? And, uh, d you know, does that impact your consideration for access? 
Well, you know, it does. I mean, you want to be able to do these safely. And if you have too much disease in the arch, it's generally not considered a good candidate for radial access. Um, you know, occlusions are generally bad. Subclavian occlusions, aortic stenoses, dissections. But sometimes dissections are easier to deal with from a radial approach than from a, a femoral approach. But it really just depends on the patient. I mean, I think from a practical perspective, I don't think any of us are routinely screening folks coming in by imaging the chest. When we do the CTAs ahead of time, unless they've had a CTA already, um, we let's see. That looks pretty good, guys. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so we're so gonna we're gonna switch CTAs, over to the other you're table. Doing a pelvis only. Generally, a pelvis only. Yeah. It, it's you know, I, I I mean, you could make the argument to to look and to do. Uh, you know, to do the arch too. But, you know, again, it really just depends on the patient. In, in most people, um, you, you have that information already. Let's, um, let's switch over to the embolic table so I can show everybody how we mix up the embolic. Just to put a bow on that discussion about the CTS with the test, do you prep the groin too for these cases in case? No, Jay. No, we don't do that. This isn't this isn't 2012. <laughs> Making sure. Well, I mean, you could say All when right. was the last time that you had to switch or convert from radial to femoral in a uh, It happens. It happens once in a while, maybe once or twice a year. All right. So we can we can look. It's just it's just not it's not worth it to do that in in the rare instance because it's very easy to take the drape off and prep the groin. It's not going to add that much time. Okay. So right here we have our, our glue table. We set this up separate from our main table because we don't want any saline or blood. We typically change our gloves too to make sure that there's no blood here. Uh, in this shot glass, I have one cc of NBCA. This is 10 cc's of, of, of oil, lipiodol. So we're gonna basically make it 10 to one. So I like to keep it 10 to one. It just makes it easier. It's easier math. Let's put it that way um, in groups of 10. That's just the way my brain works. So we mix it up, and that's it. That's our embolic. And so I'm going to take one cc aliquots. I'm going to lay them over here. I'm going to try to make sure that we keep this separate. We don't want to contaminate this with any blood or saline. I think this is probably <coughs> enough to start with. We're not going to use all of this. And then in, in this bowl, we have our D5 water, which we're going to use as flushes. And there's lots of ways to inject glue. And people that do glue and glue embolization in other territories know this. Uh, you can use an aliquot method, or you can just use a, use a push method, which is generally what we do with PAE, because we don't want to take too much time switching syringes, because we don't have more than a couple seconds before we form a plug. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go back over to the balloon microcatheter, and we're going to locate our little tiny syringe. If you guys can look over here, we have this syringe, which is the, the inflation syringe for the balloon. And so we're going to do this live. And we're going to watch. We're going to inflate this, this balloon. And we're going to try not to inflate it too much because we don't want to pop it. We don't want to damage the vessel. So this is something you want to do under fluoroscopy. Aaron, can you talk about volumes and the mix of contrast in there and everything? Yeah, so this is 50-50. You want to you put, as with any balloon prep, you want to just use 50-50 if possible. And I just like to zoom in a little bit just to watch. There it is. That's probably all we need, right, guys? Yeah. Okay. The other thing that you really want to do when you inflate a balloon in a vessel and you've changed the, the pressure downstream is to repeat the angio. Um, let's use a three. Okay. Aaron, can you talk about the the benefits of using a balloon occlusion catheter? Yeah, we might actually be able to see the difference if 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 the anatomy on their side is difficult. But basically, um, hold on. Let's see what we got here. That looks pretty good. I mean, I'm very happy with that. I'm not worried about any non-target here. Um, one of the reasons that we use the balloon, there's lots of reasons. One is that we can reverse flow in pedendal collaterals, which we don't see here, but we could potentially do that. Number two, 
uh, is to prevent reflux. And then number three would be to get deeper penetration. And so one of the downsides of glue is that sometimes you get more of a proximal embolization, not as distal as you would like. I think we can get pretty distal now with this, with this case. Um, so I think we're going to do the embolization from here. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, you know, the balloon will definitely help us get more distal in this vessel to get a much more, uh, I think, hopefully a more durable result. So we usually do this with two people, uh, one person controlling the balloon and one person doing the, the injection. So I'm going to take this deflation syringe and I'm going to connect this. Even though the balloon is locked, I'm going to connect it with negative suction. So what's going to happen is once we're ready to pull this balloon out, when we're done with the injection, I'm going to flip the switch. We're going to deflate the balloon and we're going to try not to drag any glue back into the base, base vessel, right? That's what we're going to try to do here. So this is D5. All right, so Puneet's going to flush the catheter with D5. Three cc's. And I know we're going pretty fast here. We're going to have lots of time for discussion as we go to the other side, but we wanted to start and show you guys how we do this on one side, and then we'll, we can keep talking. This is really the only part of the procedure that I think is, you know, a little bit nerve-wracking because, you know, you never you never know completely where the glue is going to go. Uh, yeah. But we've done this a lot, and so we, Slightly bigger view there. we feel pretty good about this location. So the key thing when you inject glue, um, and, and Puneet's done probably about 50 of these, um, is to go with the balloon, you don't have to go as fast, but you generally have to watch both above and below as you inject. And we're going to fluoro save this, Debbie, when you get a chance. Go a little bit faster here. So it's, it's going through that other branch there, which is probably a pudendal or a, uh, you know, maybe a seminal vesicle branch. But it, see, see, he stopped injecting, and what, he, what we're seeing is the, the median lobe completely filled. And then we also see flow down through the, through the, the collateral there that's going, to the, uh, that's going to the penis. And so we're going to let that sort of solidify because we want that to form basically a plug. And so one of the advantages of glue, as you guys can see, is that we can fill those, those non-target collaterals but not worry about small beads going distal. Yeah, I think that's a really nice example of how with a particle, when you're injecting it, you're not going to be able to control it like this. You're not going to be able to control the flow. And even from the outset, once we were in the prostate, we're able to inject the vasodilators. We're able to put up the ready? balloon to create a negative pressure system. We have an enormous yeah, amount of control here that you just don't have with a particle. You can pre-modify, again, with vasodilators, with where you're injecting from. But this is such a nice example of the control that you have with glue. So I just took the balloon down, so now we have forward flow, but the vessel's probably occluded at this point. And that's it. The other thing we could do is we could just drop a little bit of glue here just to form a little proximal plug, just a tiny bit, very slow. That's it. And then the other thing that we're seeing here is the amount of time that you have. A lot of we people inject the glue and they're going to just, you know, rip the catheter out. I mean, it really shows that with this mix, you have time to really, uh, you know, be patient and be thoughtful about how you're doing the embolization. So that we we're really happy with the way that went, and for two reasons. One is because we, we occluded that collateral, then you could see the pulsation from the pudendal going up, and so we were able to occlude that to prevent re, re, potentially to prevent recurrence, uh, and we also filled the middle lobe dramatically. I'm really happy with that as well. So that was a pretty quick injection. It took about 30 seconds because we waited, but that's really the advantage of using glue. We're at 10 minutes. 10.8 uh, minutes of fluoro time, and we're halfway done. Yeah, that's that's just a huge improvement in terms of the time three cc. Uh, that it took. I mean, I you can't compare that with par particles. No, we, we've we've all done those cases, and it's much faster. Um, okay. We had a question so we're gonna from zoom the out. audience. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Regarding instances where you might not give, you give nitro obviously pretty liberally. So any instances where you would not give nitro any medical co comorbidities? Not really. I mean, some people are allergic. I've seen in rare cases you can have a seizure from verapamil. We've seen that once. Um, but no, the answer is no. And you see that uh, rectal branch beautifully preserved. Yeah, and that's um, definitely rectal. I mean, if we were concerned, we could do a cone beam CT, but we know based on its anatomic appearance that that's a rectal yeah. branch. And now it's more prominent, obviously, because we occluded the prostate artery, which was a shared origin. A couple other things to notice on this angio. The, the pudendal and the dorsal penile artery are extremely uh, well-preserved. You see the cavernosal blush from the, from the, uh, the pudendal artery as well. 
And we actually didn't take out the rectal, which we, we probably could have, at least as we injected glue and pulled back, we probably could have taken out that rectal proximally, but we didn't need to in this case uh, because we were so distal in that vessel. And so that's, that's, that, that's about as good as we could, we could probably expect yeah, that's that fantastic to go. Result. That's a perfect result. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the obturator. Uh, we probably won't check the obturator on this side because we have full coverage of the prostate. Um, so we're going to go to the left, the, the right side now. And just but, just to highlight, you know, the collateral that we saw, the control ahead. that we had, Glad you know, there's there's a conversation now where we're at a place with prostates where it's you know retreatment, recurrence, um, and one of the ways to prevent that is going into collateral vessels, coiling things off. None of that was nece necessary here. Again, there are a lot of operators that. And sometimes with us, even if we if we were doing particles in the past, would have gone there, seen the collateral, coiled it off, and then had to do the primary embolization. You know, just another demonstration with glue about how it's a one-shot deal with the control that you have, and it's incredibly fast. It was a really nice um, example. I think, guys, I think it's a perfect segue to kind of talk about the rates of recurrence um, and what what data yeah. we have, yeah. and obviously we're not there yet in terms of. Um, data for recurrence after glue yeah, embolization, yeah. but maybe you can kind of speak maybe. to what we know so far. Maybe. So that's a good that's a good point. Um, you know, I'll just if if you guys read radiology and some people do, um, Carnivali a couple years ago presented his ten year data, uh, and and if you look in detail at that study at six years, uh, there was a twenty three percent recurrence rate at, at around seventy two months. So that's a um, you know that's high. I think we can do better than that as as a you know as a procedure that is still sort of in its I, I wouldn't say infancy, but we don't know everything about PAE yet. Um, that's a great uh, you know there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of recurrence. I think we're in the external. Yeah, let's, we're, we're in external. let's go back and just do a run. Yeah, we'll pull yes. back a little higher. All right, it's right there. Okay. Just grab that glide wire. Yeah, we need it. Okay. All, All right, right, it's in there. Um, yeah, so look, if we can do better than 23% with glue, we won't know until we're about five years out what the real recurrence rate is because, uh, like I said, the majority of the recurrence is, uh, or, or, you know, when we see recurrence at, the, at, its, at its highest rate is typically years later. So we've only really been using glue uh, for close to two years now. And so we're presenting our, um, we presented our data last year at SIR. We have a paper coming out with some of our, our, our results, but we don't have, you know, five-year data yet to look at the recurrence rate, which obviously is going to be super important to ultimately look at. Um, um, for a period, you were, uh, you know, coiling the prostate artery on the way out. Do you think that's really where the fit? failure is or are these these recurrences you know um taking place because of this collateral supply um that maybe i think it's both point? vivian I, honestly you know the cases that let's just put up that that run as a roadmap the cases that i've done and i've repeated and we've all done repeat paes if you see a lot if you see these patients you know regularly you realize that years later they start to get recurrent symptoms they don't always get back to where they were baseline um, but when you bring them back and you do these angios, what's interesting is that sometimes if you just use particles, it, it looks like nothing was even done, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's sort of, that's sort of the, the, one of the interesting things about particles is that they don't really cause permanent vessel occlusion in a lot of the cases. And they, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing in some vascular beds, but I think in the prostate, it, it, you want a more permanent occlusion. I think it's advantageous. And so you bring them back and it almost looks like nothing was done. I've had some cases where we've coiled them and the coils haven't even occluded the vessel completely and you see flow through the coil mass. And so there's lots of reasons why people would recur. It's probably about half and half where it's through the main prostate versus, you know, only through collaterals. And sometimes it's just, it's both. You see the collaterals hypertrophied, but you also see the main prostate still supplying it. Do you want to talk about fair, the shape of the enough. microwire? How yeah. do you follow these patients? Hey, Jay. How long are you, are you seeing these patients in clinic after a PAE? So I usually see them at six weeks after embolization just to, to get their initial response. And we don't really want to see them at sooner than that because the first two weeks, they're generally not, not great. They're usually worse. Uh, when they come into the office, I do, uh, obviously, we do their IPSS again. 
And then we do uh, in, in, in office Euroflow uh, as well as a PVR. If they're catheter dependent, I'll see them sooner, but that's really the only case where I'll see them at two weeks or maybe four weeks because we want to do a trial avoid. And we do that typically in the office two to four weeks after the, the embolization. But if they don't have a catheter, we usually wait six weeks and we could do a full assessment in the office. And then after, after, after the six week visit, we'll see them back again at six months. And at that point, we try to do a volume assessment of their prostate. The best way to do that in my view is to do an MRI. And so I do an MRI at six months. Have you, can you guys uh, zoom in that? on, can I get that smart mask? Sorry. Go ahead. If you guys oh, want to zoom in on this wire, if you, if you switch cameras, the, yeah, um, zoom in on this wire. Your post-treatment MRI, have you compared the rates of ischemia or, infar I guess, infarction um, using a liquid versus your prior? We haven't compared them, Vivian, but, but we, we do see uh, a fair amount of necrosis, particularly if you can get very distal. Uh, and so I think in this patient, almost certainly we're going to see some necrotic areas in the prostate. Can you guys see the shape of this wire here? Uh, yeah. yeah that's, Let's see. see that. <clears throat> yeah, so everybody that works with me knows that this is my favorite shape. It's not as dramatic as, as I guess it, it sometimes is, but I call this the question mark. And I think for prostate embolization, giving a little uh, back curve on the wire along with the tip curve gives us the best chance specifically if you're not using an angled microcatheter to get into those really angulated type one vessels. Um, and so that's the curve that we use. And this is an 016 wire. Okay. So we have a little weird angulation here in that uh, internal iliac. So Dan's working on that now. Um, now we were talking a little bit about follow-up. Uh, I do all the follow-ups myself, and I will only really refer them back to the urologist to uh, if they needed a cystoscopy or urodynamics. Everything else we we, we manage ourselves in our clinic. Uh, we see that we see the patients obviously pre and post. Uh, I manage their medications. I'll start their medications. I'll take them off medications. Uh, and I think anybody that does that wants to do prostate embolization, uh, you know, in, in high volume, really needs to become familiar with. How to manage um, how to manage these medications because almost everybody is either on them or has tried them, uh, and so you know a, a lot of patients have side effects from them, and you need to be able to manage that. Do you want to talk about what you're doing pre in terms of Euroflow, postweight residuals? Like, what do you think is the minimum that you should be? Uh, is there a minimum? Yeah, I mean the minimum. I think you need to get a flow rate. You need a you need a Qmax uh, in anybody that you're trying to show that they're really obstructed. I don't think you'd need a Eurodynamics in everybody, but you definitely should get a Euroflow and, and a PVR, which is super easy to do, especially you know in your office where you probably already have ultrasound. We're going to pull back a little bit because we're in the glute here, but we're going to set up for another run. Yeah, I mean, I think the low-hanging fruit, when somebody's watching this and they say, all right, I want to start doing more on the spectrum of Eurodynamics, you don't need full Eurodynamics, but again, the, the post-void residual and the... Uh, the Euroflow, they're not expensive, they're easy to do, and it provides you with, I think, the two most important pieces of information as a baseline. Yeah, and to be able to do that yourself in the office without having yeah. them go see a urologist. Exactly. Particularly if they don't necessarily need a urologist for, for this. And so if you really want to do PA, I think, at high volume, you need to be, you really need to be an expert in BPH. And to do that, you have to be able to take care of them clinically. We have one All right, so come forward we're going to hook up the injector here. Uh, to, and we're going to do another injection in this internal on the other side. And again, we're at 16 minutes. That was actually the longest part of the case there is getting into the internal. That, the yeah. crux of the case right there. <laughs> Aaron, we have a question in the chat. Uh, do you ever still coil out? Well, that's a great question uh, because we don't need to with, with glue. And you saw what we did on that, on that last bit of glue. We sort of put like, almost like a little plug at the top after we got that distal. And so I try to... I try to occlude the parent vessel just with the with the liquid, so you don't need coils. You can use them, but there's no need because you have so much embolic here that you can use uh, to form a plug. So no, the answer is no, Jay. Thank you, sir. All right, so we're going to do another angio here. Aaron, oh. can you talk about like the retreatment, the ones you have done? Um, what have you seen? Is it more collaterals? Is it more from the main? Is it different when you've seen uh, particles versus out. glue? Yeah. 
Um, it's usually we pulled back too much on that, unfortunately. Uh, you know, sometimes we try to get a little greedy and we pull back because we want to get the we want to see the SVA origin, but we, we're this origin's a little a little too too steep. Let me see if I can just puff it back in there. We're gonna ask we're gonna ask Dan to do that again. <laughs> I mean, again, crux of the case, right? But there. it's probably about half and half, right? Yeah, I and mean, that's really what it is. Half the, half the time it's through collaterals, and half the time it's it's through the main parent vessel. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what uh, you know how that changes when you start following these patients further out the uh, liquid embolic yeah. cohort. I have not seen recanalization through the main prostate artery with with glue. You you absolutely can see collaterals if you don't occlude them, but the main vessel does not remain patent. And the branches that you've embolized do not remain patent. Uh, so we can turn coupling uh, off. Let's put this up, Debbie. All right, we're going to do that again. Grab that glide wire. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, it's about half and half. But I, I, you know, I haven't repeated a lot of glue patients. I think only one. Um, and that was that patient, I believe... Debbie, I'll take a smart mask. If please. I remember correctly, had a uh, had had a, a a vessel that we missed initially. Um, so it wasn't that the glue failed; it was just that we didn't we didn't locate the collater collateral, which I believe was off the umbilical artery, if I remember correctly. Well, I mean, even just looking at that glue cast, right? Looking at that embolization, that's quite a vessel to recanalize that entire way, yeah. right? That's that's not. We're not dropping a small glue plug. We're not just going distally with a few millimeters. There's that's, so many studies that have looked at the effect of glue on the artery. And, and, and it, it really creates a, a fair amount of, of vascular endothelial damage um, and inflammation. And so we want to use that to our, our advantage. Uh, and that's, that's, that's one of the best properties about glue, in my view. You want something that can do that. Um, so doing, this, we're going to do this run uh, very large a little bit, little bit more. Thanks. Yeah. Are you doing a thorough investigation Go uh, for that's, collaterals? That's Just leave it there. Can I get more? Say that again, Viv. I missed what you said. I was talking you to know, Dan over here. When the when the prostates get very large, you know, upwards of 150, oh, 200 yeah. plus, you know, how is that changing? Um, sort of your how how thorough, thoroughly you're looking for collateral supply. You're almost expected, right? So that we were we were we were talking about this the other day, actually, in a case that you were doing, which Come I believe was injector. like a 200, 300 gram prostate. In those cases. You know, you you have to think yeah, about the come forward on the injector. The, there's always going to be some extra supply, so you you sort of get sucked into finding the main prostate artery. But I think the most durable results are probably going to be uh, related to you know how diligent you are about finding those collaterals. And the typical place is either the SVA umbilical circulation and or the pudendal circulation below. So you really need to look above and below the main prostate. Um, and you can use combium CT to sort of, sort of troubleshoot that too. So we're going to do another angio here. You can go ahead, Debbie. Look at that glue cast on the other side, <laughs> yeah, how deep pretty. that penetration is. It's fantastic. Oh, there we go. So Beautiful. We, uh, we see what we got here, right? We'll go. We'll go. We'll, we'll draw on the screen now that I had some practice with that. Yep. There we go. That's uh, not my favorite origin in the world, but it, it'll be okay. So, what do you think, Viv? Jay. Well, we're, I'm, uh, I'm using the other me? side as a uh, using the other side to help me guide uh, where it's coming from on this side. But is it coming off so, the pudendal right it's, there? It's looking like, it looks like a it's one here. Yeah, yeah type one. It looks, it's looking like a type one over here. So let's zoom out a little. Let's just take them through like identifying again operator internal pudendals. You know, for for people that are watching. Um, so we can go through the anatomy if you yeah. want. Does that, does that that work? Yeah, yeah. The, your mics are hopping like a little bit, so it's a bit hard to hear you My guys. My mic's jumpy a little bit. You guys want to yeah, take a look at it? Yeah, it's very jumpy. Yeah, you guys, are getting, you guys are getting a little scratchy too. Yeah, I can okay. go over yeah. that. Let me. Yeah, maybe you going over so and pointing I'm, out. I'm as good at the Azurian etch-a-sketch, so Puni's going to guide me through oh, yeah. this. 
That's um, a lot better. But in essence, whoop, okay, good. Let's mag out. Excellent. So basically, on all of these, you want to be trying to identify. I, I can't pinch out to zoom. There we go. Only Pinit can pinch so out again, effectively. <laughs> two uh, apparent, two fingers. Apparently. Apparently. So, so just yeah, to we were in. We the kind of basics like obturator. Yeah, general, sure. And so the, the pointer is going to be. Okay. So I have the pointer here. All right. So yeah. So on everything you want to identify the posterior division, you want to see the big C-shaped vessel, which is oh, it's drawing now. It's going to be this big C-shaped arm. And again, we're doing this at a 35 to 45 ipsy oblique with a tank radial. And then the vessel over here, this is the upside down Y, the distal bifurcation. Uh, that's going to be your obturator. That's the vessel that was missing on the contralateral side. So kind of at a starting point, and again, coming out, this isn't the anatomy that, the, that we're all by default very familiar with unless you're doing these types of cases. Start off looking again. Here's your obturator. Here's your internal pudendal. You want to be kind of looking in the middle for an S-shaped vessel, and that most of the time is going to be your prostate artery. And as you're looking in that area, we're seeing it right here. So we talk about different, uh, you know, origin types. I think Aaron is very, very excited in particular. My my general thoughts are that's great. Let's just find it and get into it. But uh, you know, it's important <laughs> to classify. What was the other side? Was it pudendal or gluteal? I think it was off of gluteal. It was a five. It was I have to go back and look. Um, Top five. It was glute. So it was a five. The one is going to be the shared origin. It's most common, you know, again, percentage-wise. For, for Aaron's case, we'll get into it. 30%, I believe, of the most recent data are going to well, be the type well, one. So um, we actually looked at this, and we, we're going to present this as they are. Okay, so I, I don't want to spoil it. Well, no, so, they're about equal, all of yeah. them. Approx it depends on well, what you Well, one and at. a four is probably. See, four. this is the problem when we get into the... Exactly. Or is probably the most common. I'm in Dan's camp. But uh, <laughs> well, can we roadmap that? Dan? Yeah. Put the thing in the thing. Look, we all we all need to get published. You know, we're gonna have a one A, one B, one C classification at some point. It's coming down the road. Where you know, but you know, the ones can be challenging. And again, I think that kind of comes back to what we were talking about with microcatheter selection. Um, you know, using using like an an angle true select or something like that. If you really have a challenging origin. Um, you know, especially starting out, use what you're comfortable with. Um, and, and if it's really going to be a tough situation, and again, that, that true select, it's a two French, it's a 2.8 to two. And especially in tall patients, you're going to get 175 length out of it. Um, but, you know, it's really what you're most comfortable with. The sniper obviously tracks really well, uh, as we saw in the other one so with a type handle. five. But I think a lot of Bring people consider the type ones so to be most challenging to get into. Um, so, I mean, I can't anticipate there's going to be a problem uh, here. You guys are working with a true selector, yeah. or are you with a sni sniper right now? Yeah, Sorry so so yeah. we switched, and so I was, yeah. I was actually, yeah. that might be it. Is that it? Keep going. Yeah. That might be it, yeah. Okay. Uh, I thought it was... Maybe not. Oh, no, yeah. I thought it was a more... That's the Brechtel. Lateral. Okay. More posterior one. Well, now. do you yeah. want to you want to shoot it? More posterior. We can yeah. shoot it just to see, but it. that's going to be rectal check. because it's posterior to the, uh, yeah. to the, to the prostate. So... Um, Type 1 takes the longest. We actually looked at this. We looked at our fluoro times and procedure times, and type 1 takes longer than any other type. Um, so, not surprised. And so when we have a type 1 with a sharp angulation like this, I don't love the sniper because it's stiff. So what I like to use is something really soft with an angled tip. And so this is a True Select 155 with a burn tip. And so this, I think, will give us the ability to curve and then make a quick turn to that prostate. But before we do that, we are going to do one thing and just inject this vessel posteriorly. And so when we see two vessels that look like the prostate, the one that's posterior is usually the rectal. They both have an S shape. But we'll see. Um, it could also be just the awesome back case. of the prostate. Oh, yeah. this, no, that looks rectal. rectal. That's yeah. definitely rectal. Yep. I don't think you need yeah. a comb beam CT for that. No. What do you guys yeah. think? The other thing you might be a little prostate uh, off of there at the yeah. bottom. Maybe a little bit, but that sort of... Uh, very straight, medial going branch is fairly rectal yeah. characteristic, yeah. right? And, and, the, and the, the other option on the other that side. you have, what oh, wow. Aaron was saying, the, the, the poor man's, you want to puff back? So we say? Well, it's, um, it's, it's probably better, I think, to go steeper and then we'll, we'll yeah. take a better look zoomed in. I think we're going to do another run because it's, you know, especially for everybody that's watching, I think people want to see the origin in better detail. So let's see if we can open it a little. So you can so give I, I nitro and verapamol, and to Aaron's view, point, yeah, well, uh, to his point, one, you know, it's kind of the poor man's cone beam. Well, I know you see it, Jay, but maybe not everybody in the audience doesn't see it. With, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, with the, <laughs> the one origin, obviously the steeper is going to really show you. Um, yeah, I'm going to go real steep here. 
50. That more anterior side of the uh, anterior division and open it up. We probably have yeah, and yeah, so five, five or this ten is where the here. angled catheter. Yeah. Just to we have five minutes guys, to do this. Uh, yeah, five minutes. You can see it there. Yeah. All right, let's go. Vivian's given us a challenge here. <laughs> What's the curve look like? That looks pretty good. Pull the wire back. We could also try a different catheter. Um, the angle on this is good, but it's it's a burn tip. I sometimes like a swan tip, which is only really available in the direction, um, not the true select. And the direction's a bigger catheter, which I don't love. So we'll try with this for a few minutes. Did you change the shape on your wire we, to make it uh, more it, We made it a little more curvy, yeah. The other, the other problem, and this is why these are always hard, is that the base catheter doesn't have that much of a curve on it. Oh, there hold you on go. a sec. So Puneet's going to spin the wire and sort of see if it just flies down there as he pushes. Or I can just track it and go in there. Hey, you know what? Let me follow you. Put a little back tension on that so I can follow because, you. One, because you one thing about that true select, it's so there it is. Look at that. trackable. Nice. You don't necessarily need that much nice. wire ahead of you, too. But that's awesome. Yeah, it's because she said five I minutes. Said five right, minutes. So you can get a little yeah. more yeah. wire. Then, uh, yeah. One. This needed a little push. That's great. Yeah, so there, there's your loop, right? You know you're in the prostate when you see a loop like that. And I'm not even really, I'm just sort of sliding it. You guys can see it's with one yeah. hand. It doesn't really require a lot of effort with the true select. So we love the true select for that reason. I don't, I, you know, again, I, I like the sniper, but I don't like it for that origin because ultimately it's going to be a little too stiff and it might create an issue. Um, but you guys will see in a few minutes, there's a big difference in how you inject an end hole catheter with glue than, than a balloon tip catheter. And so we're much less steep oblique here. Um, we're going to do a run, then we're going to do nitro. You good? I was gonna mag out a little bit. I like it. You like when you're not using balloon occlusion, do you try to get the base catheter even closer to sort of provide a little bit of a interesting, yeah, occlusive so, injection? Let's keep going. Yeah, further. Okay, we could do a little nitro first. Say that again, Viv. Oh, I was just saying, if you're not using a balloon occlusion catheter, do you ever try to yeah. drive your base catheter in to provide a little bit? Yes, of occlusive, uh, uh, we can. We can do that. We can do that, but I think in this example, yeah. we're not going to get it that close, right? But I think what you're, what you're getting at is, we can do the wrap mill later. Let's grab the wire, and we'll just go around that bend. We have a little bladder branch there, approximately. We're just going to get past that, and then we're going to go down, drop some nitro and wrap mill, and then we'll, uh, we'll embolize, and we'll be done in five minutes, like you asked, Viv. Thank you. <laughs> not bad. So one of the things I noticed when I looked at that angio very quickly was that the bottom part of the prostate is not filling on that angio. So most likely that's that piece that we saw off the rectal, yeah. which everybody noticed that there was something. Is that? That's the that best. looks like the superior the branch. Yeah. Yeah. Let me zoom it up. Here, let's just bring this back a little. That roadmap's not going to be accurate anymore. But that little piece at the bottom of the prostate, which we see on that image there, uh, that might be it, right? Yeah. Let's let's track and see what that is. No. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, let's see. We'll do a puff. Let's take a look. Um, it's probably going to be fed yeah. off that rectal very distal. And so I, I'm going to probably yeah. ignore that. Um, I mean, we could do a comb beam CT to prove it, but I know based on the angiographic appearance, that little piece of the prostate is probably fed off the rectal. I don't, I don't know that we have to chase that because we're probably going to have to embolize a fair amount of the rectal branches to do that. Uh, but if it was a solitary vessel, I would probably say that looks pretty good. Yeah. Why don't uh, we keep, we're still going into there. I think going? we should go a little bit more distal. Yeah. yeah. So the difference with a balloon and an end hole, and we talked about this before, Viv, we want to go more distal with the, without the balloon because we're not going to be able to uh, penetrate as deeply without the balloon. And so one of the tricks is to take the base catheter and proximally almost try to create spasm in the proximal prostate artery in, with, the, with that catheter, so you almost create your own balloon occlusion. Um, Do you want to pull back the catheter a little bit? Yeah, I might know, be a Aaron, little I think you could, once you get the uh, wire in, you may be able to, to advance your base catheter sort of into the 
Maybe. Maybe. You can give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give it a shot, maybe. We don't want to get greedy. we got to make a turn here. That's the, that's the challenge on this one. You know what, grab... Um, Debbie, grab the Asahi wire. We can show that one. That I like for these turns. We don't need a better curve on this. I can also just do a better roadmap because that roadmap doesn't look yeah. very accurate anymore. I think it's important that we kind of show the glue and the difference between both, you know, the two sides. Yeah, we're going to show it. Yeah. And then we're uh, able, able to, time allowing. Let's see that. Let's put that up as a roadmap, Debbie. We have a we have a different wire, which sometimes works a little bit better than the, than the Fathom for these sharp turns. So we'll see if this works. This is an 016, 180 centimeter uh, Asahi Meister wire. And so the nice thing about this is that we can make the tip very very sharp. So it's a little softer on the tip. I like this a lot for these 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 vessels. Also, compared to the Fathom, I think it holds the shape a little bit better. Yeah. That'll work. Cool. Let's try that. And then we will we'll be done in a few minutes. You know, the, the other thing is if you can't get the wire into the microcatheter, then you know the tip is really good. So let's yeah. use a cheater for that. <laughs> yeah. Get a back it. Okay. Sorry for taking so long, Viv. I, I apologize. Well, I think it's a nice example, you know, when we were getting into that. the. Um... Do you guys see what I was talking about? The bottom part of the prostate's missing? Yeah. Now, oh, if you had a balloon, you could theoretically fill those branches yeah. by, by using the intraprostatic circulation to try to send some of that pressurize embolic it. lower. Mm -hmm. Pressurize it. With an end hole, you typically can't do that. Yeah, at what point are you, you guys... trying to go after those branches? I mean, like you said, if it's coming off of the rectal, it may not be feasible. It's not that we couldn't do it. It's just I don't know that we're going to, you know, the risk is that we get a fair amount of non-target rectal ischemia if we really get distal into that, that spot. And so, you know, we... I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say today no, but if you know he does doesn't get the best response in the world, we could consider it. But I think given that we see the the majority of the prostate hopefully being treated after this injection, we'll probably just see how he does, and we have to bring him back to do that. I don't, in my experience, that's not going to be a significant uh, contributor to his symptoms. Again, he's got severe IPP. Look at that, went right in. So. You know, that's why I like this wire is because it has a little bit of a better curve on the tip. Um, we're just going to, we'll probably go a little bit further if we yeah. can. Uh, that's a oh. small branch. You probably just, yeah, they come back a little bit. Yeah. You don't really want to be too greedy with some of this stuff because sometimes when you get really distal, you miss certain branches. I don't think that's the case here, but Let's grab some nitro. Yeah. Grab them. See that sharp turn? But I think this is a nice demonstration, again, getting into the type 1, making these maneuvers inside, getting a little bit deeper. You know, people talk about a lack of torqueability from radial. I mean, I think this is a nice demonstration of all the things that you can do. Again, it's about the tools in your toolbox. Um, so this might have been challenging with a different microcatheter, but with this type of microcatheter that will track so well, we can get into any of these types of vessels. Yeah, the True Select has really been a game changer for prostate, I think. Especially the angled tip. And, you know, some people have their opinions about angled tips. Um, but I really like it for this. Yeah. It actually may be hurting us here. Here's some saline. Yeah. How much uh, nitro and verapamil do you usually give, we give in these a lot. In direct installations? Into the usually every time we inject, it's about 200 and 2.5 and verapamil. So I usually have at least 1,000 ready and about 10 of verapamil. Let's see if we like our spot here. That looks pretty good, looks guys. Looks pretty good. Let's see what you say. Yeah. All right. See, we're missing that spot at the bottom, but that's okay. Nice. We're going to do a little bit more nitro here.
All right, let's grab the uh, embolic, Puneet, and we'll yep. get going. And then the other nice thing about radial axis is he can go home basically in an hour. Uh, we'll have him pee, we'll take the band off, and he'll go right home. Um, did you talk Puneet, about you want to talk about what, what we send on? the patients home with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so we sent him home on a week of antibiotics. Um, and we also prescribe a, a Medrol dose pack to help reduce some of the inflammation that we're going to elicit in this prostate. Um, additionally, we sometimes we'll send him home on some symptomatic control medications like Mobic or Viridium. Uh, but pretty much it. No, no pain medications, just Tylenol. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, this is obviously the majority of his prostate in the middle lobe here. So we're going we're gonna to show you how we do this differently without the balloon. So let's do that now. So this is D5. We're going to do D5 first. And so the, 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 the technique is a little bit faster. You can see there's a collateral going to the other side of the prostate too, which is nice. Yeah. So this is always the challenge, um, how to get it distal without refluxing it, especially when you have a small vessel. We do have a long runway here, so we can go pretty fast. I'm not worried about any collaterals at the bottom of the prostate going to the penis, so we're going to inject very fast here. And so Puneet's going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on looking at the catheter and making sure everything looks good on that side. Okay, yep. here we go. Injecting. You already it came back a little bit there, so stop. Yeah, you get a little bit of reflux there. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to take a – you can fluoro save that, Debbie. You got it? Look at the difference, right? So yeah, it shows a huge yeah. difference when you have the balloon occlusion and when you don't. I pulled it out. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> so With it out, some of that you, may I don't know if end you guys up saw. percolating forward a little bit just because of how thin your dilution is, but it's yeah. obviously a very big difference. But we have a complete occlusion the of, the, of the prostate artery here, which is nice. I'm just going to rotate a little bit so you guys can see. But the middle lobe is well treated. Um, and we're probably going to get a few areas of necrosis on the MRI in six months, but I'm really happy with this result. Are you guys happy? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Question, We're going to do question a final the, run. There's a question yeah. from the forum. Uh, thoughts on pushing past a glue plug? Former fellow asking this question. <laughs> which I which think one? This might be our last question. Uh, you know, someone who's pretty experienced in prostate. Thoughts on pushing oh, past a glue question. plug? Dr. Pasham. You mean, well, I don't understand the question. Yeah, it's, I don't uh, really understand it either. We have another vessel there? What do you guys think of that branch off the pedendal? Yeah. Uh, why don't we get into it? It looks suspicious. Yeah. And check it. It looks suspicious, right? Yeah. Actually, no, It's it looks like rectal. Mm. See that? Yeah, no, I think you're done here. Yeah, it's fractal. What do you guys think of that branch off the pedendal? Should we investigate that? You see the one we're talking about? Yeah. This one right here. Yeah. Can you play it out a little further? Does it... Uh... Da, da, da. Debbie, can we grab another micro real quick? You can give me a, a true select. I can't tell Is if it's going to the... the Pudendal? I'm not sure. Is that going towards your Are we doing uh, to your glue? on the live case? Is this something we want to talk about? It's if we're, definitely we can do posterior, this. yeah. 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 I think I see something there, but why don't we just take a look? Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing we could look, do is I if you guys wanted to. I don't know how much time we, we have. Could do a, we could, could do a really spin and, and look at the up. and look at the uh Yeah. Um, it's so, up to you. yeah, we don't have to do this part necessarily live. Are there any burning questions, anything on the chat that you think we should really try to address? Or mm, I mean, there's always any burning questions, questions that you guys have getting catheter yeah, stuck. But I think, you know, the thin dilution, that's not really a concern. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had that bit so. be an issue. The, the, what's more common with the, with the thin dilution is that the glue actually travels too far, too far up because it's so, so loose. And so you could theoretically get... If you're not careful, a lot of reflux, and it, it doesn't necessarily solidify until it's close to the base catheter, and then that's where you got to be careful because you don't want glue in your base catheter, obviously. Yeah. 
Um, I think this was a fantastic What's your, what, case. What, what does everybody think of that vessel? Do you guys think that that's going to be a, uh, a rectal branch? It looks like it probably would be. Yeah, I think it's going to be rectal. But we'll check it. I'll take the counter just for the sake of argument. <laughs> but I think we're going to do this off the live yeah, feed. Yeah, off live feed, yeah. Yeah. It's a great case. All right. If there's no I other burning questions, I think that'll just be it. All right, guys. Well, it was really yeah. this was really awesome to, to, to start off our, symp our, our treat live symposium. We're going to have another case in a month. Um, and we're going to also uh, put this case up on YouTube at some point in a small edited format so everybody can rewatch it. Um, and really looking forward to, uh, to seeing everybody at SIR. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.